I'm um, Henry Finder, and I'd like you to welcome uh, Jeffrey Canada. Um, Jeffrey Canada is uh, CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone and one of the most influential social entrepreneurs on the planet. Uh, Harlem's Children's Zone is a program that uh, Obama described uh, during the campaign as an all-encompassing, all-hands-on-deck anti-poverty program that is literally saving a generation of children. And he resolved that he would extend the Harlem Children's Zone model, he would replicate it, in 20 cities across America. And as president, he has, in his proposed budget, actually laid down the money to do that. This is, uh, in some ways, the best of times and the worst of times. And the way in, in which it's the best of times is never has so much money uh, been shoveled in the general direction of educational reform. Um, and uh, never in recent years have we seen uh, anti-poverty programs receive this kind of directed energy. Um, I think to start with, which is uh, by way of analyzing what has happened in the first 100 days, what we expect to happen in the 100 days thereafter, is looking at this model. Why is Obama so determined to replicate the Jeff Canada formula, and what is that formula? It's what I, what I think, of as, think of as the select all approach. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you, and uh, uh, good morning. Uh, can, can I just say that I, I've been here for this whole morning and it's been absolutely terrific but Malcolm scared the hell out of me can I <laughs> can I just say that I mean I think I'm overconfident and but if you know you're overconfident you is that better I don't know so <laughs> I'm, so he, here you know I have been at the same job for 25 years and uh, people don't recognize that and you know people uh, 15 years ago people were saying oh you know they're doing a great job and I really thought we were doing a great job uh, and then we began to look at the data. Uh, and the data said we weren't doing a great job. In fact, when you begin to look at data for poor uh, children of color in Harlem, uh, the children are actually doing worse than when I started in the business. And so if you just think about being a professional and uh, after being at something and thinking you're really doing great to actually find out things are actually worse than you uh, even imagined, uh, it made me rethink our uh, plan. And so if our goal was to end the cycles of poverty, where you have grandparent poor, unemployed, parent poor, child poor, it's just generation after generation, that's what we thought we were doing. We were not doing that. We weren't accomplishing that. Uh, we decided that we had to focus on a place. Now, there are some places in this country, and Harlem is one of those places, where there's not one thing wrong for children. Everything is wrong. Housing is lousy. Health care is lousy. The schools are lousy. You've got gangs. You've got drugs. Uh, you've got unemployment. I mean, uh, a child gets over one hurdle only to be tripped up by another. And if you think you got your child at 12 and they're doing good, you lose them at 16 because they end up in a gang. And so in these places, what we had done as professionals was try and figure out, well, what's the most important time and what's the most important intervention? And some people said gang intervention, and some people said teenage pregnancy, and some said early childhood. And the sum total of all of those individual efforts were that we were not moving the needle at all, and we said we had to do everything. Uh, we had to do everything. And in these places, uh, you had to figure out how to do everything. Now, uh, my board is uh, mostly business folks, and you know, when I said everything, they said, you know, Jeff, you can't do everything. I mean, we have to target, you have to focus, you have to figure. But, if you try to uh, change uh, a community and you don't tackle all of these things at the same time, I don't think you're going to be successful. So what do we try and do? Uh, the first was we had to rebuild community. What does that mean? We had to go building by building, block by block, creating tenant associations, creating block associations, saying to the adults, we have to take responsibility for our community. We have to clean it up. We have to make the children understand we as the adults are in control. And where you have communities that are besieged, uh, when you go to them, it looks like no adults care at all or people are powerless. Children grow up thinking that they have to figure out the rules for themselves. And we 
all have read Lord of the Flies. It's not a pretty picture what happens when young people decide they have to make the rules to keep themselves safe and other things. So uh, we partnered with business. We actually physically began to change Harlem. The second thing is simple, but we have not found another place like Harlem in the country where they're doing it. We designed a series of best practice programs starting from birth and staying with children until they graduate from college. Uh, the issue is, uh, we, all of the literature is clear. Our kids are behind literally from the moment they come uh, out of their mother's womb, and it gets worse every year. So our theory is, don't wait until children are in middle school when they're two years behind. Uh, actually get them from birth, get them on grade level, and keep them on grade level so they never get behind, and then you don't have to do what I call a superhero bit. Right? You get a kid, they're 15, they're reading three years behind, and then you have to find superheroes to come in and try and catch that kid up. They never reach their full potential. If you get those kids on a platform where they are performing at grade level, you can actually allow them to reach their potential. I'll give you an example. Uh, my board chair, uh, Stan Druckenmiller, uh, his daughter uh, fell in love with chess. And Stan came to me and said, let's create the best chess program uh, in the country at the Harlem Children's Zone. And then you all could go whip up on all the private schools. Wouldn't that be fun? And I said, yeah, that would be great, right? So we started a chess, he got the best instructor in the country. We started our kids in second and third grade. Uh, and last year, our girls were number two in the nation. And when they go and play these other kids, people suddenly started thinking, but no, you have, to, you have to understand, people suddenly started thinking, why are these Harlem kids so good at chess? And they started thinking probably because their lives are complicated, they have to move two steps forward, and <laughs> then come over to the right, right? No, they're just as good because they get training from great people. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I love, if, if, you listen, if you look at the work, the outliers, I mean, it was such a great panel because what are the children in Harlem spending all of their time doing? If it's trying to play basketball, right, or if it's trying to be a rapper, uh, you're not gonna end up with these kids being successful. But if kids really spend the time on task, you can get these kids to reach their full potential. So we stay with kids through college, because once our kids get to college, they drop out of college. So you've gotta get them with degrees. Uh, and we think that's the, the, how you get a victory. The third thing is scale. Uh, there are 10,000 kids. We're working in a 97 block area. There are 10,000 kids. We'll have about 8,000 of them in our program. The idea is you have to influence, uh, again, you get to the tipping point. Uh, kids pass values if they're positive or negative, like a virus, right? One kid bumps into another kid and they transmit a message about community. If the messaging is all negative, if the messaging is focused on what the kids are listening to uh, in their earphones uh, about selling drugs and getting high and shooting people, well, you tend to end up with kids transmitting a series of negative messages. If you touch enough kids and you can give them positive messages around working hard, being successful, uh, uh, doing the right thing, well, those kids bump into one another and infect one another in a positive way. The last thing is accountability and evaluation. Uh, in the end, this is very hard work. The best efforts often fail. You can try something really, really hard and it just, and you've got to know because the tendency, see, we've been a little bit like the financial community, right? You can just go along and then suddenly have massive failure. Uh, and we're in, I think everybody thinks that's a crisis in the financial community. It is standard operating procedure in poor communities. Massive failure is considered normal, right? Now I'm just being serious about this. So part of what we have to do is have a set of evaluation that says, you know what, this is not working, we have to change it, or this is really working. And in the end, you have to hold people accountable. I get in a lot of trouble around the country because I believe, you know, if adults don't educate children, they should lose their jobs. They should not stay in their jobs. It's a little bit like they're saying to people, but I just, wanna, I just wanna draw some parallels because I was wondering why did they put me on this panel? But now I got it. See, if, you, if, if people destroy the banking industry and they don't get fired, some people have a problem with that. But if people fail poor black kids, they never get fired. No one, it's not even a discussion of that they should be fired. It is assumed that they should keep their jobs and we think in the end this work is too hard. 
Uh, if the end result of failure is everybody gets their job, everybody gets a raise, everything goes on, the only people who really lose are those poor kids. So this issue of accountability and data we think are absolutely critical. We deal with health services, social services, dental services. People are all excited. Oh, Jeff gives all of his kids dental care. This, this is America. This is not Haiti. We have enough money to do that as a standard. People think that's the ceiling. That is really the floor of what we need to provide for kids if they're going to be successful. Let me just drill down a bit. You um, threw a couple of bombs, and you <laughs> uh, we'll get back to that. And uh, you mentioned as well this issue of scale. Now, you've done this at a 24-block uh, uh, area. 97. And and you've done it now in a 97 yep. block area. You've done it both ways. Yep. Do you find that you're more effective with the larger area? Here, here is the challenge, uh, and, and I think this is, uh, anyone who does scale is gonna run into this. There was a time when we were small enough that I could actually observe what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I could tell whether or not it was good. I've been at this a long time, I've been well trained. I used to consider myself an expert before this morning, but... <laughs> But I, I could go in and I could look and I could say, no, no, that, no, 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 we don't do that here. That's not. Once you start getting to scale, I can't do that anymore. Now I've got to hire people to make sure that the quality level and the culture of the organization stays the same. And it is very difficult uh, if you don't pay particular attention to the sort of management infrastructure. And I was not trained. Uh, at a management school, right? I was trained actually working with kids, but there is a different set of skills to be a good manager, uh, and a lot of these organizations, they suffer because you, the skills are not necessarily transferable. The fact that I ran a good program, that, that does not necessarily mean that I'm a good manager and I can hire and train other people to run good programs, and I think this is the challenge uh, with scaling up, is that uh, you've got to make sure that the quality and the culture in your organization stays the same. I'll give you an example. Uh, George uh, Caldoun is my chief operating officer, is here with me. And about uh, six years ago, in one of my most difficult places, 144th Street, which is just an area that's outside of our zone, it's always a lot of issues there, a lot of drugs, a lot of guns, a lot of violence. Uh, I went up to one of my schools one day, and I just noticed I didn't see the adolescents. And I said, geez, uh, where's that? He said, oh, no, we have about 50. I said, no, no, we used to have 100. They said, yeah, but you know what? Those adolescents, they cause a lot of problems. And I said, so what do we do? So, so we don't have them, you know, we have a much nicer program if we just sort of keep. And I, the whole point of the program was to serve the adolescents, mm -hmm. right? No, so you have to understand how shocked I was as the head of the agency to walk into my own program and realize that someone had made a decision mm -hmm that this part of the work was too complicated and messy. We'd do a much better job if we just didn't deal with them. That happens in programs all the time. The further away you, the person who has the passion and the love and say, we, we've got to work with the most difficult kids, the further away you get from the business, the more tendency the business has to find a safe, comfortable uh, sort of resting place, right? Where you can work nine to five and everything is fine and all those things that used to keep me up. Now, you know, so, and we can do away with that if we just simply don't deal with that group. So it is constantly revisiting the programs. I have a belief, I have no science to this, that the half-life of a good program is about six months. You start a good program, you come six months later, it's half as good as when you first started it. These programs just deteriorate without constant management and attention, making sure you hold them up to standards. Well, that raises the question, which is, can we replicate uh, Harlem Children's Zone 20 times in 20 cities without 20 Jeff Kennedys? You know, uh, this is a question that I get asked a lot. And uh, my, my answer to this is that it's absolutely yes. Uh, I thought that maybe you needed someone like me to do the first one, and for this reason. Uh, I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars in private dollars to do this work, right? And I don't assume that everybody can do that all over the country. Uh, we had a good connection. My, you know, my board chair helps me with a lot of money. We had a lot of Wall Street money that came in and helped us. So that we needed to figure out, and the reason we had to use private dollars is that the public funding is so categorical that you can't really do what you need to do. You can only do what they let you do. And so uh, you take my four-year-old program, that for the last six years, we've had 100% of our kids enter kindergarten on grade level, right? The public funding for that is two and a half hours out of an eight-hour day. 
Yeah. Right? And that's just state policy. We can't get them to move to do full day funding for preschool. So if I had to use that state dollar, I, the program would not be successful. So we use private dollars to do that work. What we think will happen with the Obama administration is they are going to put substantial public dollars uh, to do this kind of a comprehensive integrated program, which I think is important. Uh, will, we, will it be easy? It won't be easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the first time that I think someone has tried to take this to scale. And so we have to be very uh, concerned to make sure that we get real good leadership, real transparency, real accountability, and then people are prepared to work really hard. Uh, and in the end, the accountability, and this is the place where I think it gets the trickiest around the country. Uh, when we started our schools, I told our Chancellor Joel Klein and the mayor, and I told our board uh, that if my schools weren't more successful than the public schools in five years, I was going to fire myself. And I said it publicly as a public accountability, and I meant it. I got all my staff together, and I told them, of course, I'm the last one leaving. Just so, <laughs> just so it's clear to everybody. This is not, I'm not kidding, though. No. Just so it's clear to everybody that we're all in this together because the work is hard. And if you lose that level of accountability, you'll end up with a series of excuses about why poor kids don't perform. Mm -hmm. So it is doable, but it's not easy. Okay, but now even if you have you know full funding from the uh, the federal government, which is allocated an additional forty four billion dollars to the education department uh, in the uh, in the stimulus package, even if you have that kind of support, you still have the uh, teachers union. You still have Randy Weingarten, and her job is not to protect the rights of good teachers, it's to protect the rights of all good teachers. Uh, lousy teachers pay union dues too. Yeah. And this is, uh, of course, a group which uh, endorsed Obama. This is a powerful factor in communities and uh, in national politics. Usually people are much that. more subtle when they bring this up. I see uh, <laughs> he goes right for the heart of it. Look, this is a, this is a huge issue. And Randy and I, uh, you know, we're actually friends, uh, even though we're on the opposite ends of mm -hmm. tenure, right? My deal is, if you are a lousy teacher, you should be fired, right? And, that, and I believe that. And my oldest son, Jerry, uh, my, my oldest son is a, a, a lawyer, and uh, he's a partner in a law firm here in New York. And he, he called me last week, and he said, Dad, all of my friends are mad with you. And I said, why, Jerry? He said, because they're, they're, on the internet, it says that you said that we should send all the lousy teachers to the upper middle class communities, <laughs> right? It's supposed to be and, the other way around. And I said, I did say that. I said, if we can't fire them, then let's send them all to the upper middle class communities because at least those kids, they can afford one lousy teacher. Instead, what happens is they send all the lousy teachers to the poor communities, and my kids can't afford that. So yes, I understand your friends are, are, are mad with me because they're all upper middle class, but the truth of the matter is the poor shouldn't be the dumping ground for lousy teachers. And, and you know, and there's no... There's... There's no subtle way around this. And when I say there's no subtle way around this, uh, in the end, uh, if we have a system where uh, lousy teachers are unable to be fired, just unable for any reason whatsoever, you just can't fire them, uh, they will end up in the weakest communities, right? Because the strongest communities will always figure out how to get rid of them the strongest principals, the strongest parent groups, and they're going to end up in my community, and it's simply unfair. And this has been a documented failure. We have no lack of data. This has been a documented failure for 40 years in certain communities, mm -hmm. uh, and a constant in this is an, it's sort of an inability to change the flexibility around lousy teachers. And I'll tell you the other thing. The school day is too short, and the school year is too short for these poor communities. These kids need more time on task, and that's another union issue, mm -hmm. right? That, that, you know, my schools are open uh, through the first week of August, right? So we will have school all through July, the first week of August. Now, yes, my scores are better than the public schools, but we have a longer day and a longer year. It just makes sense. So if you are not prepared to make those kind of changes, I'll tell you what happens all around the country. In, in no city with poor children of color are the kids doing well. None. They simply fire the superintendents. And the superintendents leave New York. And I thought, you know, because you think New York's the center of the world, I thought when we fired them in New York, they just died, right? <laughs> but they don't. 
They go from New York to Miami, from Miami to Chicago, from Chicago to Oakland. They just travel around the country, the same folk. And, and after three years, they're all fired and they go to the next place because the physics of education requires that kids who are behind have a longer time on task, and that costs money, and people aren't prepared to spend the money until we've had this president who said we're going to put real money in education. I think now we've got to force the political will to force the, the adults to do the right thing for children and give these children a real opportunity. But realistically, this is the deal that this nation has had with its teachers. Uh, we will pay you very little money and we'll give you a lot of job security. Yeah. And what you're saying is, I'll give you no job security and I'll pay you maybe a little bit more money. Why is it a good deal? Yeah, well, you know, uh, let, me, let me change a little bit uh, the uh, analysis because my position is that we have to pay teachers like professionals. I mean, I really believe we have to pay, we have to treat them like professionals, but we have to pay them like, and here's another, and, and most of this I get through my own life. So here's my, this is a real experience. So my son, I told you he's a lawyer. When he finished law school, he took a job in Boston. He called me, he said, Dad, I, I got a job. He said, they're gonna pay me $140,000. I said, what? <laughs> right out of school? He said, yeah. I said, well, what are you going to do? Because I'm worried now. Like, God, you got to keep this job, right? He said, I, I don't know. They're going to train me. I said, what do you mean they're going to train you? He said, well, I'm first year. They know I don't really know lawyer. And they're going to... I said, wait a second. For $140,000, they're actually going to train you how to be... And he said, yes. And I thought, well, there's a way, because this is the deal. You make a lot of money, but they work you really, really hard, and they realize most people can't make it through that regimen. They're going to weed out the weak. The ones six years later who are still standing, they'll start thinking about making them partner. I think we need to do that in education. Get a bunch of really smart young people, work them like hell. Let the ones who are able to deal with, because look, this is, if you've never taught, you have no idea how hard it is. If you've never taught, you have no idea. Now, after, look, I got my undergraduate work, all preparing for teaching, I did my master's at Harvard at the Ed School, went into the classroom, all of that training got me through November, right? <laughs> after that, I was drowning. I'm serious, I was drowning. This was the hardest thing I'd ever done, and it is hard teaching. So getting people mm -hmm. uh, to think that you can do this, uh, taking you know, two and a half months off, uh, leaving school at three o'clock. It just is not realistic. That is not the way that this country is going to stay competitive. We've got to change those rules, and it, and it needs radical change. In terms of change, the uh, Secretary of Education, Ari Duncan, uh, has posted essentially uh, $4 billion in uh, challenge grants, what he calls the fund um, for the uh, race to the top, as opposed to the race to the bottom, which we tried before. Um, what should he spend that money on? Who should get that money? What well, kind of innovations do we need? Well, look, I think the people who are blazing a path uh, in education right now are folks in the charter world. I think there's a lot of innovation going on, which is what we need. Mm -hmm. We need experiments. Not all of them are going to work, but let's try and figure out what are the six or seven characteristics of things that work, and let's try and scale those things up. Uh, so here, here, and I think he's doing a, a lot of this, by the way, but I'm going to simply lay out what I think is important. Uh, the first is uh, there, there ought to be merit pay. If I'm great, if I am really good, I ought to get paid for being really good. Look, being able to move a group of kids a year and a half in a year's time in math, and that is a real skill, and not everybody has it, and people should be rewarded who have it, uh, and we don't do that. Uh, having real data. Uh, using data in real time. Here's what drives me crazy. The kids take the test. You know what? I literally, on my BlackBerry, just got my reading scores, right, from our March. Just now, just this morning, they sent them to me. These are standardized uh, tests. These are standardized tests. You got them a week it later? It is May. It's okay. It? it is May. I, we, what good is that going to do me now, right? when most of the schools are closing down to know this kid is having struggling in ELA. Now look, we've been testing all along, so we know how our kids are doing, and, and, and so, but if the idea of testing is to certify which kids are successes and which kids are failure, then give the information late in the year. If the idea of testing is to figure out what we as adults need 
to improve that kid so they catch up. Give me information in real time so I have time to work on that kid and say, oh, this kid is struggling with two-digit multiplication. Let me spend some time doing that. So the collecting data, using real data, and giving it to professionals, and then rewarding folk who use data to drive performance, to me, is essential. And I think, look, capitalism works everywhere else except at school, right? Every place else, if you're really, really good, you make real a lot of money. In schools, if you're really, really good, you get the same thing as everybody else. It doesn't matter how good you are, there is no way for you to increase your pay. I think that's foolish. I want bright, ambitious people who think they're good, mm -hmm. who are prepared to put it on the line to demonstrate they're good, and then I think you'll build a teaching field uh, where we'll be able to be competitive with, I think, the global market. That's terrific. I have uh, a ton more questions. I'm not going to ask them, but uh, you will be able to buttonhole uh, Jeff Canada after, uh, I think, during our next break. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.